education is a massive global sector, right? Um, it's on the order of $6 trillion globally every year is spent in education. That's inclusive of K-12, higher ed, um, a lot of corporate training, but it's it just massive, massive numbers. Within that $6 trillion, though, there is so much fragmentation and diversity and complexity. Um, just think about even in the U.S., like how many subsectors there are, and then multiply that, you know, across the rest of the world. Um, and it's um, it, it's an incredibly important sector, both to individuals and to nations, right? So it, it's important to individuals because people literally life, you know, life changing opportunities come out of good education. Um, so it, it literally changes the arc of people's lives of, of you know, family's ability to earn a good living over their lifetime, have op you know growth opportunities. From a from a, a national perspective or country-based perspective, countries recognize that um, having an excellent education system or having a well-educated population is critical to economic development and growth of countries. Welcome to M&A Science, where leading M&A practitioners share lessons learned from their experience. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from M&A Science, visit mascience.com and subscribe to our free newsletter. Every Monday, we share highlights from our interviews and invitations to events as we build the greatest community of forward-thinking M&A practitioners. Again, that's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of M&A Science. Joining me today is Tom Horton. Senior Vice President of Corporate Development at Kaplan. Kaplan provides educational and training services to colleges, universities, businesses, and individuals around the world. Kaplan's also a part of Graham Holdings, a conglomerate holding company that trades in the New York Stock Exchange under GHC. Today we're going to talk about staying true to your M&A strategy in a fast-paced, changing environment. How's it going, Tom? Going great. It's great to be here, Kisan. Thanks. Thank, thank, thanks for taking time with me today. Can we kick yeah. things off with a bit on your background? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so I've been at Kaplan for eight years now. Um, actually makes me one of the more, more junior people <laughs> on the senior leadership team. A lot of that team's been there for 20, 25 years. So um, a fun role. I head up uh, corporate development and strategy um, for the organization. And um as you mentioned in the opening, we're, we're owned by uh, Graham Holdings Company, which is a um, it is a, a sizable holdings company. It was formerly known as the Washington Post Company, um, and it is a public company, but it is effectively a family-owned business. It's uh, the Graham family of um, Washington Post fame. So Catherine Graham, who is, um, was the publisher of the Washington Post for many years and is well known for Watergate. Some of you might have seen the movie The Post recently with Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks. That's about the Graham family. So um, there we're the largest holding of uh, Graham Holdings Company now. Uh, Washington Post was sold a few years ago to Jeff Bezos from Amazon. Um, but um, the the Graham Holdings um, Company now is um, still very active in media. Um, but Kaplan is its largest holding, about 70% of the revenue base overall. So um, they've been in the education sector since acquiring Kaplan in 1984. Um, and it is a, as a public company, it's, it is very unique. It's, um, it's something like, um, it's like a, a mini Berkshire Hathaway. And in fact, um, uh, Warren Buffett was very close to Catherine Graham and sat on the board of Graham Holdings for 30 years. So um, there's a very strong imprint of Warren Buffett on the way Graham Holdings works and as a result on the way Kaplan works. So um, framing that because it's just, as we get into the conversation today about sort of staying true to your, your philosophy and principles when it comes to investment or M&A, um, that is uh, very much a result of our ownership um, by Graham Holdings and sort of the Buffett influence on um, approach to investing. So I think that'll be kind of a fun area of conversation today. You've been um, heading corporate development there for some time. Uh, yeah, 
a, a while. So it's, um, uh, but again, not nearly there as long as the rest of the, the folks in the team. So it's, it is a really, it is in many ways like a family run business. I mean, this team is exceptionally tight. People have worked together for decades and whole careers. So it's, uh, I still feel like the, the new guy on the, on the block, <laughs> even though I've been there eight years. Um, but it's been a, a fantastic place to work. It's the, it's a really great, uh, sort of values driven culture and company, very mission oriented around education. So, uh, anyway, that's, that's my role. Well, uh, I'd like to start with maybe just framing the education sector itself, because the sector used to be really conservative behind the times, but now we're seeing more and more innovations. What's going on? Yeah, well, it's the the market has been through um, a, a period of really rapid change, and um, the, it was especially accentuated by the, the pandemic, right? So you've, I'm sure, a lot of listeners have experienced this with their kids being out of school and staying home, and suddenly, you know, the pandemic coming on, there was just this huge flip to online education and a massive changes. That um, that change really um it didn't it didn't like create absolutely new trends but it accelerated a lot of trends that were already happening in the market um radically and it attracted a lot of new attention and investment from investors globally in the sector so that's kind of the backdrop but but really like the story of online education um goes back 20 plus years actually to the mid 90s um when it was really came out of the US originally when like University of Phoenix started and other players, but Kaplan was one of the early leaders and innovators in online higher education when, you know, it was unheard of. Um, so between 20, uh, 2000 and 2010, so one decade, we went from essentially like 35 students in the first year to 75,000 students by 2010. <laughs> In in an on, a, a Kaplan branded Kaplan University, a Kaplan branded online higher ed program, um, and we were just one of many examples of, of the rapid growth. So, kind of big picture, um, that the development of online education, um, it just it grew so rapidly, and it was a, a product of the fact that higher ed institutions, just generally, as you mentioned, they're they are super conservative. Like they're they're incredibly powerful brands. You don't often think about them as brands, but they are incredibly powerful brands that um, just you know stuck to, to traditional models and traditional ways of doing things. They weren't particularly innovative or fast moving. And one of the things that um, became apparent was that you know most higher ed institutions were focused on serving eighteen to twenty two-year-olds in a traditional model on campus and wouldn't even think of changing that, right? But there were huge segments of the population in the U.S. that, um, you know, started to get a college degree, didn't finish, other people never even went, and then who got into the workforce and with all these requirements from employers for higher ed degrees and other drivers just, you know, they had to figure out how to how to get degrees while working and well past the age of 22. So there was, you know, because of the lack of innovation in higher ed sector in the US, um, there were new entrants that were able to come in and start serving the segment of the population that literally hadn't been served. Um, and it unleashed a lot of really interesting dynamics in the market because uh, as you know, there were a lot of for-profit companies that got into that space, establishing their own degree programs, building their own brand names. And there was a real backlash from um, the higher ed institutions when that, you know, when that segment grew, it was like the only growth segment within education. And when it, and when it became like 11, 12 percent of, of overall enrollments in a given year, um, that's when it really started to get attention. And it was highly, highly profitable early on because um, you think about, um, you know, the, the economics of face-to-face -face classroom campus-based delivery versus the economics of doing it online. It's sort of like the difference between the economics of a Broadway show and a movie, right? Um, 
So yeah, it, um, what, what happened was there was sort of like a price umbrella for of, of face-to-face education where, you know, people know today, like to get a, you know, a year worth of college at many institutions in the U.S. is like $65,000, $70,000. And that's, it's that expensive because there's that much cost involved in delivering it, right? Of all the infrastructure, of all the, you know, face-to-face classes. In an online world, a lot of those fixed costs and and sort of re- and variable repetitive costs go away because you can you can deliver like an asynchronous online delivery. You can record something once, like a movie, and it you know with the right kind of support and services around it to students, it can be just as effective a mode of delivery. But the cost structure is radically lower. So there was a lot of money flowing around early on in those years um, within within that sector because of the pricing umbrella of face-to-face and sort of the lack of competition and innovation. Um, that's changed over time. And um, you're, you're seeing the, you know, sort of the proliferation now of online models. Like finally the higher ed institutions have, have made it their own and they're all accepting it and they're figuring out, oh, we have brand power and it's in our best interest to, serve these other segments. So they're all piling into the space as well to, to drive online delivery. Um, so that's, that is one segment of the education market and one trend. Multiply that by like five or 10 because there are all these other, there are all sorts of other macro trends happening in the market um, that are really reshaping the ed sector um, globally. And so it's just to step back, it's been, you know, I'd say, there's been a long fuse of, of uh, many, many years of innovation in the sector, online education delivered being one of those things. Um, but the pandemic absolutely, you know, hit the, the, the turbo chargers on that um, and has really amped up the market. Um, so a few stats for you, just generally the um, it, education is a massive global sector, right? Um, it's on the order of $6 trillion globally every year is spent in education. That's inclusive of K-12, higher ed, um, a lot of corporate training, but it's it, just massive, massive numbers. Within that $6 trillion, though, there is so much fragmentation and diversity and complexity. Um, just think about even in the US, like how many subsectors there are, and then multiply that, you know, across the rest of the world. Um, and it's um, it, it's an incredibly important sector, both to individuals and to nations, right? So it, it's important to individuals because people literally life, you know, life-changing opportunities come out of good education. Um, so it, it literally changes the arc of people's lives, of, of you know, family's ability to earn a good living over their lifetime, have, op- you know, growth opportunities from, an, from a, a national perspective or country-based perspective, countries recognize that um, having an excellent education system or having a well-educated population is critical to economic development and growth of countries. So it's just, it's so central to so many things that people care about. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the order of magnitude of the size when it comes to like the, uh, I mean, just getting to the point about M and A and investing and all that, um, a couple of stats for you in with, um, there are often cycles in, you know, education, but with the pandemic, there were absolutely, we saw absolutely explosive growth. So in 2021, there were 450 acquisitions roughly globally. Um, and that value, that total value is about $30 billion. Um, and that's, that is probably small compared to a lot of other sectors, but um, just the sheer numbers and the growth of it's amazing. It, so the 450 acquisitions that year was a 40% increase over 2020, which was a similar increase over the prior year. So, um, the, and the valuations have kind of gone through the roof. So uh, like median 
uh, enterprise value on a, on a revenue multiple basis was about three and a half on average in 2021. But for larger companies, it was at 6.2 times revenue. Like those are some pretty eye popping revenue multiples um, just generally. So there, it, it's a sign of like how much interest and buzz and activity was happening in the market. Um, on the VC side, the global market in 2021 for investment was on the order of $21 billion. Um, and that was three times the level, $21 billion was three times the pre-COVID numbers. So uh, what it does, it's still not massive compared to other sectors again, but it is relative to where education as a sector had been. Those are just some kind of indicators of like how explosive the growth has been and you know what the what the buzz is. There were um, um, since 2015, I think there have been 38 new unicorns um, that have come out of venture investing. Um, 17 of those were minted last year. So um, <laughs> there's been a whole bunch of IPOs as well. So like whatever sector or market you're kind of looking at or whatever lens you're looking through, there's just been a tremendous amount of activity. So can we go back? One yep. of the stats that caught my attention was going around 2000 with the online model, building up to 75,000 students. Was that all organic through acquisitions? I wanted to get a sense of what your strategy was and some of the acquisitions that you did do. And then, you know, how you're sort so, of playing with the current trend going on. Yeah. So honestly, um, well, let's see. The um, higher end was almost entirely organic. I mean, that, that's how rich the opportunity was. Like when we figured out the business model for that, we, we just, we could grow it just because of the nature of the business. We didn't really need to acquire into that. It was, it was a matter of like, you know, the, the marketing that you could put into it just allowed for that kind of growth. And it was a national model, very unlike, you know, the, the, the current higher or traditional higher ed model where it's all sort of regionally based and your campus, you're constrained by campus, you're no longer constrained by campus. So you could achieve with national advertising, unbelievable growth. So you played um, on first comers advantage, essentially being one of the first big names to go out and do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it was, it grew unbelievably quickly. Um, I would say though, um, just stepping back, we have done since 1996, we added this up recently. We've done 120 acquisitions and um, we've deployed almost 2 billion in capital on acquisitions since 96. So that's a long period of time. But there were other segments um, at, beyond just our Kaplan University higher ed segment where we um, did do a lot of acquisitions. So for a long time, we were in the vocational ed sector and that was a case where it did make sense to do a bunch of acquisitions. So there were, you know, there, there were, um, you know, there was a lot of roll up and consolidation opportunity within that segment. And we, we absolutely used acquisition as a strategy to grow. Another area that we're very heavy into is professional education. Um, and that is, um, you know, that think of that as like, uh, test prep and licensure for a specific discipline. So if you want to be a nurse, you take NCLEX. If you want to be, um, if you want to earn a CFA, you will take CFA courses. Um, so um, that those markets in professional ed and what's called continuing professional ed, you know, sort of lifelong learning, a lot of it is mandated. Um, um, those were areas where there were a lot, there was just huge fragmentation of a lot of mom and pops and there were a lot of opportunities for roll up in those spaces. So we've used acquisition historically where it makes sense in order to drive growth, but where, where you can drive organic growth, um, that's typically our preference to, you know, to, to grow organically where we, where we're able to. Can you walk me through where the M&A strategy fits in? Yeah, um, M&A, like we, we think about, we think about um, four different types of capital allocation and, and strategies. So, um, 
And M&A is, is sort of the, the third preference on that list because M&A traditionally is pretty hard. <laughs> so um, hard to get right, uh, but very powerful when you do. So um, the first one is that we would, um, honestly, like we found some of the most success in partnering. Um, so even above organic growth, um, a, lot of, a lot of elements of our business, um, which I can get into, you know, describing what they are, but th they do best when you're working with really strong partners with established brands who have complementary skills and capabilities. Um, so that's typically number one for us. And we typically do that with either higher ed or corporate partners. Um, number two would be organic again, because we, you know, you sort of control all the levers, but the, the conditions have to be right for organic to really drive the kind of um, success and growth you need. There's a, uh, organic is also very hard to do, but it's, it can be more capital light. Third would be M&A. Um, and, um, you know, we'll do that again with very consciously in very specific situations and sectors. Um, you know, you, we typically go through the, the build versus buy type of analysis and um, we're, um, anyway, we, we can get into more detail on that. The, the fourth one just to round it out is, is equity investments. Um, and um, those are, we definitely will, we do that selectively as well. Um, and we like doing that. We've been pretty successful at it. Um, but it's um, you just have less control and sort of you know ability to make sure that whatever you're investing in, you can try to bring in house over over the long haul. So um, we we right now we run a portfolio of, of about twenty investments of you know just pure equity wow. investments in other companies. So okay, pretty active there as well. Yep. Yeah, let's take apart the M and A strategy. How, how okay. do you shape that? What does that look like? Um. Yeah. So again, we're, we're, uh, we, we go through a process all the time of trying to figure out like where M and A strategy is going to best support our, our overall strategy and growth. And then we'll, so we do a lot of work around developing, um, an M and A playbook that what we would call that. So just, you know, by sector really looking at, um, you know, if we, if M and A is a good fit for this line of business, then, you know, who would be on the short list of candidates to go after. Um, generally, we would much prefer to proactively develop opportunities than reactively respond to, you know, whatever is coming on the market. Um, so, you know, and, and typically through competitive banker-led processes. Um, we do participate in those often, um, but we're also realistic that when you do that, um, you're, you know, the, the, the likelihood that you're going to get the winner's curse and overpay for something is higher. Um, Very true. and we, we would just much rather prefer to bring in, uh, companies that we've developed relationships we, with, we know the management, um, and, you know, they're in a sense, less competitive, um, because you're, you know, you're, you're going on sort of the trusted relationship and that approach. So that's that's one general um, approach to it. We, um, in terms of acquisition, um, we we have very specific criteria that we that we evaluate candidates by. Um, there are five of them when it comes to acquisition. So for stepping back for all the different areas of investment that we pursue, we have criteria. <laughs> so whether it's organic growth, it's equity investments, it's acquisitions, we have criteria. Um, and we, the general approach on those is, look, you don't have to answer the mail on every single criteria. You don't have to nail it, but the preponderance of support has got to be there across those. And there are areas where they can get knocked out. Um, so happy to kind of share that. Yeah. You, you want to take me through the five criteria? Yeah, sure. Here. Um, I will. So on acquisitions, uh, the first criteria we look at is just we want to see a strong history of earnings and track record of growth. Um, so we just we want evidence that there is a strong underlying business there that can deliver results. Um, the second, so that's sort of the look back 
Um, the second criteria is look forward, just long-term market visibility. So Kaplan's ideal holding period for an acquisition is forever. Like we, we literally want to buy things that we will layer into our business and um, reinforce that business, like add to the flywheel of the business. And so we, um, a big driver of that is, are the markets that they're in, like growth markets and healthy. So we want to, at a minimum, we want to see that looking ahead is like, you know, we can't predict the future forever, but for the next 10 to 20 years, like we think this is going to be a rich vein and growth opportunity. The third thing is strong management. Um, and that's very much in sort of the Buffett, uh, the Buffett style. Like as a holding company, you want to buy companies where the management wants to come along with the business and not step away. Um, so we, we look for strong leaders and managers. Now that would, um, that's not necessarily needed or true when you're doing a pure bolt-on and we do plenty of bolt-ons, but um, having um, at least, you know, a strong management team that was there before and built a good business, that's, that's another indicator of, you know, strength of the business. The fourth area is just that, that whatever we're buying is sort of within the competency of our existing flywheel. Um, so it's, um, we don't like to do typically like really big step outs and take big risks. We want things that are going to, we, we sort of know how they work, but we know how to do them. Even if they're kind of, we do like adjacencies, we just don't, um, and we, we continually want to grow and innovate, you know, the range of businesses that we have, but we, we just try to avoid like really big step outs or things that are total flyers that are not going to, you know, have any relation to the existing business. Now, again, that's one that we will, you know, there may be cases where we do step outs and we try new things, but we do that very consciously, right? So we might relax that criteria. Um, the fifth one is reasonable valuation. And um, price at the end of the day is such a huge determinant of whether or not acquisitions are ultimately deemed successful, whether or not you are able to earn a reasonable return on the invested capital. And we, that's why um, at the end of the day, it, you know, price factors into everything. We looked at all these other, look at all the other criteria, but at the end of the day, is this something that we feel really confident we can deliver the value against and, you know, get a payback in a reasonable period of time with reasonable risk and, you know, add to the, you know, sort of the, the enterprise value overall. So, so you look at value as a factor of its own. Yeah. Yeah, we really do. I, you know, it's, um, and I, you know, there's some there in practice, there are a lot of things that we do, um, you know, to, to kind of bring this whole process to life. Um, but we like, I, you know, I, I was in my education and training was, you know, was, I remember doing like in B school, like working on calculating a whack with, it took like three pages in, in a, in a conglomerate business to like figure out the appropriate whack. And we, you know, have seen tons of models that are just so complicated at the end of the day. Like one of the things that, um, you know, a lesson learned and an approach that we've adopted is just, to really step back and focus on the fundamentals and deals and not get overly whipped up on complicated models and valuations, like really trying to get in to evaluate business models, understand the earning capacity of a business as it stands and not make huge assumptions around synergies or uh, you know, complicated, we don't do a lot of financial engineering type of evaluations because we don't approach the market that way. We have Graham Holdings as a very strong balance sheet. We don't we don't typically worry about financing the way that a lot of other people do or use that as a tool. And we keep it very focused on um, the fundamentals of what makes for a viable, healthy business and what the earnings is now and what we think we can do with it. Um, and that goes into um, you know, then, then you sort of apply the multiple based approach and, and figure out like in a range what we're willing to pay for. But, you know, when you, when you focus on the fundamentals and 
keep your discipline and wits about you on this, then you you come up with a price that it's worth to us, and we you know we stick to that in negotiation processes, and we're we're you know we're fine walking away from things if it if it gets too if the dynamics get too rough or the price gets too high, and we you know we just don't allow ourselves to get pushed too high. Now we we will stretch on on certain deals where we think that it, you know they're extremely valuable to the company, but we do that again very consciously and, and selectively. So to recap, because I like this pretty straightforward. First thing you're looking at is history of earnings, track record of growth. Then from there, it's looking forward 10, 20 years out and what that's yep. going to look like. Then you're looking at the management team, making sure they're going to stick around and they're well fit. They're also how it fits into the flywheel with yeah. uh, your, the way your model works. And then making sure you're getting value out of it, that the yeah. valuation is reasonable. And then when we tie this back up to your strategy, that's when it starts going into what verticals you're focused on based on your, your business yeah. units and where you want to double down or not. Yeah, yeah. Good example. So like right now, uh, we we are very strong in professional ed sector and we're very strong in in the healthcare vertical and the financial services verticals. Um, so we um, we really want to, you know, double down in those areas and those are still pretty fragmented markets. So we've we've been pretty active the last few years in professional ed and doing bolt on acquisitions and doing even some step outs. So you know, we acquired a while ago a um, a really niche firm uh, with a great long track record, strong management in the engineering and architecture segment, which has nothing to do with financial services or healthcare. But it like that is that's it's it's a professional ed business that has many many similarities and a strong team. And we looked at that and said, hey, look, this is kind of an opportunistic acquisition here at one level, but it's this is a, we think this is a really good investment. So we'll, um, you know, it's just a good example of where we might do kind of an adjacency or step out. Um, and, and, you know, we, we aren't always firing on all cylinders and just doubling down on what we currently do. We're, we're stepping out every once in a while too. Do you pay attention to these early stage? For example, we have an M&A Science Academy that we put out there maybe a year and a half ago, yeah. but it's early. It's early. I mean, you're, just now getting past the whatever, you know, we're approaching the, the half million revenue mark. Um, do you track that or is it just, eh, I come across it. Uh, when, when does like things start getting interesting? Is there a certain revenue number, something like that, that you sort of look for or things, are you just seeing a lot of their marketing? Like what, what starts drawing you in to yeah. be interested in the company? Man, uh, that's a great question. I think we, um, and a problem to solve for is like there, there's so much going on. The ed sector is so big, and there's so much going on right now. You can't. That's what I'm saying. Like we just, I was bored during COVID, and we launched a new business right. line, and it's it's in your wheelhouse now. Right, right. <laughs> and you should be and, tracking it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, we yeah. So we do a lot of that, right? I mean, this is part of like we do, we do that the playbook work again, and and if it fits into sort of a theme that we're developing. Um, then we we will do scans. Um, we won't catch everything, that's for sure. When things get interesting, I think, or when, um, like for if we're going to do an acquisition, we again just given our philosophy, we would our preference would be to see that there's, um, you know, that that it one that there are proof points in the business with the business model, right? That it's gotten to a level of maturity where it's like, yeah, we can look at it and say, yeah, they're, they're onto something. This is, there's actually a viable business model in here. Um, and then you'd start layering on like, well, is this a big enough segment to be like a needle mover for us? Is it on strategy? That, that's the, it would go through those kinds of screens. Um, there are, um, like what you're describing and what you're doing right now is around, I think you're, you're in a per, per, particular professional vertical, right? You're, you're talking. Yeah, that, that's the thing. I'd have a hard time selling you on a TAM because we don't even know what that is. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, is that, yeah, yeah. I mean, are we done at 1 million? Are we done at 5 million? Which for you, that's like not, 
Well, it, it depends, right? I um, what One thing we're super interested in thematically right now is what's going on with communities. Um, so a lot of, a lot like what you're doing and there are a lot of other players out there doing with podcasting and things like that is actually building um, community-based strategies. And those, like that's interesting to us. Um, it, it actually, to step back and uh, I haven't really described kind of the breadth of Kaplan yet because we're, we're made up of many, many parts. Um, we, we can get into it if you think that's relevant, but one of the things that, um, you know, we, that we faced as a company is Kaplan, like the origins of Kaplan were in test print, right? That's sort of what it's most known for in the U.S., even though today that's like a very small portion of what we do. But what we found in our business is that we, um, we tend to be very, we will see students, the same student, multiple times over the course of their career, but we're very episodic in dealing with them. So if you think about just in the frame of test prep, the way things have historically worked, like we, we've been in SAT and ACT prep for a long time. Again, very small chunk of our business, but what we're known for, we, so we go out and we acquire students we market to them, you know, we have acquisition costs. We bring those students in for like a relatively short but highly important chunk of time. And then they go to college. They get into college that they want to go to. They go to college and we might see them again when they decide, oh, I'm going to become a doctor or a lawyer and they take MCATs or LSAT. So we reacquire them, right? And then we, yep. we have another like very intensive high value add um, engagement with them on something that's very high stakes for them getting into med school. And then we might see them again when they get their, they do their medical licensing, USMLE, um, or nursing, NCLEX. So we're touching students like multiple times, and but we're reacquiring them. And one thing that we're trying to do is become much more relevant um, to a student uh, along their journey and to be engaged with them um, across that. Uh, we're not the only ones doing that in the ed sector. A lot of people are trying to solve that problem because the, the fundamental drivers in the education sector are literally cost of acquisition and LTV, right? It's, it's kind of the, the same drivers of SaaS based models. So, um, you know, the, the, and especially as like Google and Facebook have just dominated the marketing channels, um, and you know the other other big tech players are there's so much competition now for students that you know the the the, the cost of of those leads and ac acquiring students through those channels is going through the roof. And what we are very conscious of is trying to acquire students through our own unique sources. You know, not relying on those channels where we can avoid it, and um, making sure we we are engaged with students so that we don't have to reacquire them every four years, right? Um, yeah. So in any case, this is a very long and way around the story, but on community building, like that is a really fascinating way to maintain engagement with people. So we're, you know, that's that's an area that we're we're definitely really interested in doubling down on. We're doing investments, we're doing acquisitions, we're doing organic things. That's that's broadly a strategy that's very interesting to us. So, so to the extent that you've built a, a, a you got proof points on a business model, you're, you've got momentum. There's a, you know, there's a, a, a segment of the population that is really interesting and attractive. Then that, that's when it gets hits our radar and gets we get serious about. I keep working my history, make sure I got a <laughs> good financials for you. Yeah. Well, so let, let's take that example, um, especially like the community one, because that's up and coming. How do you take this strategy and get your organization aligned around it? Uh, that is a great question. So, uh, again, the pandemic kind of threw a bomb into the middle of, of uh, how we traditionally gone about things. And um, it, it's actually been... Um, We've been really lucky in many ways that it happened because we, I think, we're we've come out of it strong. So, um, what traditionally we would um, how to summarize this? So, Kaplan 
as a as sort of a family owned business and you know people have been there a long time like it, it um it has its idiosyncrasies culturally like we I've worked in other organizations where there's like a real operating structure that gets put in, like an operating system that gets put in place to do strategic planning. And um, Kaplan just like that would not work at Kaplan for a whole bunch of reasons. So um, we, what we did have were, you know, like series of kind of leadership meetings where we get together face to face, usually in New York. Um, and you put a lot of effort into prepping those sessions and, um, at the end, they were all great sessions, but nothing really ever stuck. Like our, our units would come out of it and just go back to, you know, business as usual on the backside of it, even though there are all these opportunities where if we could pull together the capabilities and the assets and the resources across Kaplan, we could really get after like new, bigger opportunities. So when the pandemic hit, those meetings got canceled, right? Um, they would typically be meetings of like 30, 30 to 40 people max. What we ended up doing though was um, creating a whole new approach and series of meetings um, online where we call these the Kaplan Leadership Meetings, KLM. And we um, have, we were able to broaden the audience in that, engage more of the leadership because we weren't, you know, having so many people take a whole week off and travel for these other meetings. And we really um, just systematically got after um, starting to work, you know, broader strategy issues for the organization and doing it in a way that was going to work for Kaplan. So, you know, what, what doesn't work is to have like, you know, a, a centralized team like mine, and it's not a big team, but it's three of us. <laughs> um, but to have our team go out and basically say to the units, here's what we want you to do. Like that does not work within Kaplan. It, it would not work. But what we were able to do through that process was really come up with um, like some governing frameworks and approaches that everybody can align to. So uh, an example would be, you know, I just mentioned about, about how cost of acquisition has gone up and we are trying to innovate our own preferential sources of students. So um, in order to lower CACs and to, um, you know, not just be in there competing against every other education vendor that's out there. So that's a really good example of one of these sort of planks of strategy where we can talk generally in these KLM meetings about that. And we can, we can, pull out examples from different business units that are doing that or are trying to solve problems around that. And that informs the whole organization about both, you know, the strategic intent and ambition behind it, and then examples of what's working and not. And it gets people collaborating and sharing ideas. So um, that's a really great example. I'll give you a very tangible example of how that played out in M&A. Sure. So, um, we acquired a, a startup called BridgeU that um, is essentially like a, it, it does college advising and creates a, a platform that college advisors in high schools can use. And they specialize on international schools that are all over the world, right? So there's, there's like 10,000 international schools across the globe. And when we talk about international schools, so you go to a place like Malaysia or Indonesia or uh, Spain, and there are high schools that generally teach in English. They align to either like the British curriculum or the American curriculum or um, the international baccalaureate, uh, the BAC. Mm -hmm. And, but they, they serve kids in local geographies and emerging markets. And there's a very high preponderance of those kids who want to study in the West, right? So to the extent that you can go into those schools and develop, you know, tools that are really helpful to the professionals, you know, who are running college advising and to the students and to the parents, where you make it easier for students to learn everything they need to know about 
applying to schools in the West and you know, helping to facilitate that process, that's extremely valuable, both as a source of unique students that colleges love and um, just a really, you know, it's a, it's a very unique way of sourcing students. So it's a, it's a good example in a bunch of dimensions of both like what we do on that strategy, you know, coming out of that kind of strategy process and what we do on MA. How'd you find that opportunity? Um, kind of networks. <laughs> so well, I guess that, that, that's where I was curious about when you're communicating the strategy and getting this dialogue internally, how far does it go? Is it just purely people holding a VP level title or does it go even broader than that? Like, yeah. It's fun. I mean, we've been evolving. So we've been at this now for what, like two and a half years with this new format after the pandemic. And we aren't going back. We'll supplement with like face-to-face -face meetings. But one of the things that's happened is we've been adding more people as we go. And in some cases, depending on the topics that we're picking off and, you know, we'll meet right now, we're, we're sort of doing it. We're doing it like every three to four months, having some form of meeting. Um, and, um, we're, we're adding, depending on the, we have a very set agenda, sort of the, like looking a year ahead. And as we hit specific topics, we're, we're extending this to a broader set of people. So there have been, um, you know, director level people and we'll, there's a certain core group and then there's certain people that rotate through, but as we're expanding, we're also, even though we, we typically don't go above like 65, 70 people at, an, at any one of these sessions. We will put the material out there or like recordings to a slightly broader group. So we are, you know, it's really helping to drive awareness and ultimately alignment, which is what your question was about. You know, it's, that, that's, it's having a huge impact around that. And we're, again, we're solving it in a way that works for the particular idiosyncrasies and culture of our business where it's not, we're not, we're sort of bringing people along. We're, we're soliciting ideas and information sharing. We're providing kind of governing frameworks and tools and kind of lessons learned for people. Um, this, is, this helps you stay true to your strategy, even though this market's been upside down the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, I honestly like the, uh, we, one of the things we did this spring was everything we're talking about today around investment philosophy. We had an entire series that involved, uh, you know, a bunch of pre-reads, podcasts, interviews, um, uh, and then live session where we talked about our investment philosophy broadly and tied that to what's happening in the markets. And so we had a lot of really rich Q and A that's really around cool. like, you know, one, one of the things that um, people who aren't, you know, as steeped in like the, you know, our investment philosophy to date would question is like, well, you know, you just got to pay what you got to pay on an acquisition right now, even though the markets are hot, we need to acquire that company. Or, and, and so uh, why aren't you doing that? And you're just like, people would get very, frustrated that you know they may they put all this effort into like coming up with ideas and we basically say no because the prices are too high and you know there are people you know getting that understanding and alignment has been key i i think broadly even the markets externally will look at us and say oh like kaplan's very stodgy and you know it's not it's just not with the times right now around you know like participating in the market and we get a lot of, you know, in some cases, like attitude from bankers when they're running a process and we're just, we're out because it's just, the prices are too high. And I, you know, we look in really hot markets, we can look naive and yeah. uninformed, but I, you know, right now what's happening in the markets, we're actually, you know, people think we're wise. <laughs> so yeah, you're going to, you're going to be ready to go on a shopping spree pretty soon if things yeah. uh, continue the way they are. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, one of the things I wanted to touch on is in a prior conversation, you told me about some not-for-profit transactions you've done. Um, and I'm not sure if it's either 
to converting a non for profit to a for profit, or I know you had that partnership with Purdue where Yeah, that, it's the Purdue thing that I'm talking about. So that, that was taking for profit to a non for profit. Yeah, that was that was an outgrowth of um the challenge what, what I didn't say about the higher ed market um was that you know when when we grew to 75,000 students and all these other players got into the space, the the universities and uh, others you know, the Congress reacted really aggressively and they went after for profits. It's still a really big issue right now with the Biden administration. Um, but we, um, the, the market got really rough as a result of that. And there was a whole new crop of entrants that came in who had not for profit status. They were really like for profit models. They were new companies that, that emerged, but they were playing to the not for profit you know, they're not for profit positioning. And then universities themselves started getting very active in, in the space. So the traditional for-profits um, got really, they were targeted and, and really whacked. And, you know, for, for good reason, there were a number of players that were just, you know, there, there was so much, so much money in the space that it attracted a bunch of bad actors, but the bad actors like, you know, target for everybody. <laughs> so, um, they, um, you know, our board of directors at Graham Holding decided to, um, you know, to exit um, our own, you know, our own branded for-profit university. And we were looking for ways to do that. We ended up doing a partnership with Purdue where we, we essentially, we sold them um, the academic side of the operations. We, we literally sold them that for a dollar um, but we, as part of that, entered into a long-term servicing agreement with them where we, where we managed, you know, we had all the plumbing and the infrastructure to, to run the non-academic side of it. And so we're in a, we're in a long-term partnership with them over that. So um, it's a pretty much a carve out. Yeah. In a, in a way it was, yeah, we, um, they, Purdue is in absolute control of the academic quality, the academic standards, the delivery, you know, of the, of all the teaching and a lot of the advising and Kaplan um, is a service provider to them for a lot of the, of the, um, you know, the, the key elements of the business around, you know, marketing to students and recruiting students, providing support early on you know, helping students, um, you know, make the transition back in or, you know, to being students and being able to succeed. So um, there's a lot of back office type things that we do and things behind the scenes. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. And they have, um, there's a provision in there where, um, you know, the, it is a long-term agreement, but they're like, if they eventually want to buy us out, they're able to do that. Okay. So it's ever, a very unique, it's a very unique structure. It was um, just the the whole model was was something new and different that we we had to go through. It took us a good year um, of just um, kind of completing that deal with them. It was it was effectively like a disposition that we that we did, but but it was one that had all sorts of. Um, it was almost like an acquisition as well because we had all sorts of problems that we had to solve for to make the the relationship um, get incentives aligned and make the, the relationship work. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of a lot of the, kind of innovative problem solving. It's interesting. That's the fun part about doing these interviews is you learn about these unique deal structures. Yeah. Have you ever been on the other side where you've taken a not for profit entity and turned it into part of your for profit? Not that I'm aware of. Um, no, that's I, I, that's a I lot more complicated. <laughs> I've come across a few deals like that. Yeah. And um, I was just really intrigued by that. How, how does that work? How do you go back with all the, the back taxes? For yeah, years? no, I have I had to advise, uh, there was a, somebody who worked at Kaplan as a small startup who was trying to do just that. Um, and so I gave him a little bit of advice, but there's, you know, there are a lot of tax consequences of doing that. Um, yeah and complexity. So I've personally never been through that, but yeah, just curious if that was um, ever the, the opportunity. 
let's get into what are some of the big uh, lessons learned from your experience? Um, yeah, I gave like a couple of them just around sort of like, I guess, KISS principle and focusing on fundamentals just when it comes to M&A um, when you're evaluating acquisition op opportunities. Um, they're just generally like acquisitions are, are just hard to get right. And, you know, so don't overcomplicate them. <laughs> um, and, you know, that whether that's, um, you know, again, like the, we typically won't bank on synergies because it's usually like offsetting negative synergies. <laughs> so if, if you're making your case fully on synergies, like beware. <laughs> um, the, you know, I think the, the other thing in, in, in the ed sector, like with the advent of sort of like technology and education, there are a lot of companies that are positioning themselves as tech companies. And honestly, they, they aren't at the end of the day. Like it's, it's really hard to, to purely tech enable education. Um, so just being realistic about that is, is kind of key. Um, so understanding like most education typically ends up having a fair amount of variable cost in it. Um, and online, we were talking about this earlier, online can reduce that and it can reduce fixed costs, but you know, asynchronous online on its own isn't always gonna cut it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there's like one player in, in the market you've probably heard of called Coursera. Um, and Coursera has got like a hundred million claimed users, you know, globally right now. Um, it started off as, as a MOOC, one of these massively open online courses, and it was for free. Like they use freemium strategy to bring a lot of people in. Um, but they're really, they're, they're very aggressively partnering with higher ed institutions, like leading institutions, helping them bring certain courses online. And then Coursera has built a platform and they, they, they're offering um, whole portfolios of branded courses to higher ed institutions, to corporates, and they're going global. Um, and they're even getting into offering full degrees online at a much, much lower price point like, um, you know, terrific degrees for $30,000 or less, like the whole degree. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the reality is like, th th they're onto something. There's definitely that, like they, I think they have a lot going for them um, around this kind of platform-based strategy and that, that approach. But I, I think their Achilles heel is um, frankly that um, most students, have a hard enough time learning in face-to-face -face classrooms. And, you know, so independent self-study totally on your own in an asynchronous mode is hard. Like, I, so for them to really be successful and get and yield educational outcomes and return on an ed educational investment, you've got to deliver the support and the services. And so, I, I just think that that's generally true. And, and Kaplan has really deep experience in that. We're like super, we're super focused because of our test prep DNA, we are super focused on educational outcomes and kind of the return on investment. So um, I, mean, I think that's one where, you know, we will solve our own, our own path to, to participating in sort of the global online higher education and corporate marketplaces but um, service and support will be an important element of what we do. And really know your business model, know your strengths. Yeah. Play off of them. Yeah. Um, what else can I tell you about? I like lessons learned. Uh, we have a lot of debates internally about um, should we, getting back to like the, that example of the engineering and architecture company, like should we do opportunistic deals or should we always be purely focused on strategic deals? Um, like does it fit in really central to, you know, centrally to one of our, our strategies? And I, you know, honestly, I think we, there's about, there's an argument to be made for both. Like we, we do absolutely do these kind of strategic deals um, that are enablers of, of broader strategy and have high value, but we, we do have a lot of experience and good experience with doing like smaller acquisitions that are kind of 
more opportunistic or both have that sort of, you know, like build on your, you know, layer on additional layers of earnings in the company and, you know, can be successful in, you know, creating new growth avenues for the company. So um, that's, that's one thing. Um, the, you know, generally, you know, other lessons learned are just around, um, it's not so much related to acquisitions, but but like lean business development approaches, where we're we're always trying to think about how do we make how do we chunk up like big investments into smaller investments and and layer them on incrementally, um, and have sort of decision points. So um, you know, as like in any new business venture, you are you're always facing kind of risks because of the uncertainties. Like you don't know if your business model is gonna work. You don't know if you'll have product market fit. And so in any venture that you're trying to go after, even if you've done an acquisition as like a base to start with, and you're trying to build from there, you wanna think about um, trying to be, um, trying to figure out what the biggest uncertainties and risks are and like knocking down early as you can the proof points on those and only spending as much money as needed to like figure that out <laughs> um, and kind of making decisions as you go. So we really, we try to employ that approach. I don't, I don't know if you run into that a lot with um, as a methodology that other companies are using, but it's one we really believe in. Hey, you started, when you mentioned it, I started thinking of like roll-ups because that's a big thing where you got to just get better at it and but that that's the nature of it doing it you have more control over that before you bet the house you're at least yeah. validating yeah. that this is actually going to work and it doesn't always work that way like we've you know we, we've had misfires too where you know we, we've had a business unit team that is aggressively arguing we got to spend a hundred million dollars to get into this sector you know like we've got to plant a stake in the ground and be an early mover. And in one case, we did that um, broadly. In this, we, we, there's a whole um, emerging area around new economy skills training, like you see in these coding boot camps or mm-hmm. like data science or uh, digital marketing. And we, were, we acquired um, very early on one of the early boot camps. It was actually, it was like the Kleenex brand of, it, it's, it was called Dev Bootcamp. And we did an acquisition um early on that's where the bootcamp moniker came from and paid a bunch for the acquisition and then it was it was all like face to face um site based delivery with individual teams so we had like you know a site in San Francisco a site in New York and so you have rent you have to do all the b2c recruiting to go out and recruit the students and it was a, it looked like a really good business when we bought it. And that was going to be like our stepping stone into that space. Um, there were some others that kind of got into it at the same time. And that market turned into a bloodbath because everybody, there weren't really barriers to entry, which you know we hadn't thought through properly. And everybody hogpiled into it. And it became really hard to recruit students at a reasonable cost of acquisition. And you only had them for like 13 weeks. Um, so you could charge 13 and $14,000, but like the, the economics just didn't work. And there were like our, the team that did that, you know, that did the acquisition, that was going to be their stepping stone. And so they were advocating like before we'd even gotten proof on that one, you know, in that environment, that one, uh, boot camp in San Francisco could work economically. You know, they were really pushing the like, we got to have 10, 20 of these set up. And um, so we ended up, you know, having a lot more operating losses on top of that. And we we eventually just, we, we, there was, we tried to pivot it, we tried to sell it, you know, and it just, we ended up getting out. So we, we ended up losing money on that. Um, but it was kind of the, like over the long term, there have been companies that have been pretty highly valued and successful, but they they were more like fast followers and they tried different models um, that were more capital light and weren't relying on B2C. And, um, you know, that is a market that will exist. 
we were just in there kind of like hadn't thought through it enough and we're in there too early when, you know, there was just, you know, a competition went through the roof and it just, you know, would have taken as much investment to try to get ourselves out of the hole as we got ourselves into. Right. So it, um, I don't know, it's good, good testament to like, you know, really thinking through again, the fundamentals and like what, like what the landscape, how the landscape's likely to evolve, what the business model looks like, what are the moats around the business? Um, really thinking that through from all aspects and then being nimble in the approach, um, which we, we really weren't. Like we, we got really locked on too much to one model and didn't pivot fast enough. So we weren't the only ones that got, got whacked in that uh, environment, but there, there have been you know, fast followers and others who have been successful. We weren't in that case. M&A ain't easy. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, what's the craziest thing you've seen in M&A? Oh, uh, I've seen too many. I've seen, I've had interesting moments. I don't know if I've seen anything truly crazy. You have to have. Then you haven't done an M&A if you haven't seen anything well, crazy. Well, I, I will say we did, uh, there are a couple examples. Uh, one, when we did the, we did uh, an acquisition that we closed on March 19th, 2020. So that was oh, oh, oh. a week into like, utter panic around the pandemic, right? I think it was March 13th when like New York went, went berserk. Um, so we ended up closing that deal, but um, there was a, it, you know, it, it almost didn't happen because of, of the pandemic. And we, we definitely, there were a lot of people that were spooked by that. And there were some, uh, you know, uh, negotiations in the end just to, to make it, everyone was trying to conserve cash and all that. And we were, we negotiated the end to just, you know, like the, we said, we'll, we'll honor the deal and go through with it despite the world seems to be falling apart. Um, but we're, it's gotta be on the following terms. We don't ever like to do that. Um, but that was a very extreme circumstance. Um, I think there are other, we weren't alone in that. And a lot of that's happening now as well, right? <laughs> People are yeah. retrading on deals left and right. Um, we definitely don't like to do that. Um, so that was rough. I like another one. Um, we had we had a deal um, where we bought a small medical simulation company that was doing some really innovative work, and they were on the verge of bankruptcy. But they had um, they had an equity. It wasn't sorry. They had a a grant that was made from. Uh, one of the richest um, entrepreneurs in India of like 10 million bucks. And um, they had, as a result of that, they had certain rights for global sales and all that. And we just didn't want all that complexity. So we basically, it, it was a tiny acquisition at the end of the day. And we weren't, you know, we were basically saving it from bankruptcy, but um, the negotiation on it took six months <laughs> because it was uh and it was tiny. I'm talking like less than two and a half million dollars of an acquisition, right? But we had to negotiate with uh, the representatives of one of the wealthiest guys in India over this grant that had been made. So they were acting in a, in a sense like it was equity, and you know they didn't want to they didn't want to lose that investment. But it was a very complicated negotiation to to basically get what was going to be required for us to even take it out of off the verge of bankruptcy. You didn't, you didn't finish uh, it. So those were, those were interesting. Um, I don't, um, yeah, I've had other crazy experiences, um, like almost getting, um, arrested in Israel during an acquisition, but it wasn't related to the acquisition because I was outside a building taking a photo of downtown Tel Aviv and it happened to have the IDF Israeli Defense Forces headquarters in the frame unknowingly. Oh, wow. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> uh, so, oh, that's funny. Yeah, that was a fun one. Um, Where'd Tom go? Anybody see him? <laughs> <laughs> he was only going out for a minute. <laughs> so I had to remove it from my camera. It was a digital camera, thankfully. <laughs> Well, it's good. Let me let you keep the camera. <laughs> yeah. Tom, thank you so much for this conversation. I enjoyed it. Yeah, same. Thank you. And here's to the deal. <laughs>